Hello and welcome to the Roundtable Podcast. My name is Shogun. Joining me today is my good friend and Royal Court member, Zoo. Very much looking forward to this interview. Uh, Zoo is going to teach us about the mythological character of Anzu, who appears in Sumerian and other legends, who is highly important and highly complex, but very little known in the modern world. So without further ado, make sure you've joined us on the Roundtable Discord server, where we record this podcast every day, usually at 9 central. Also, make sure you've joined us on YouTube and BitChute, where you can find over 200 awesome podcasts. Make sure you like, subscribe, and follow to those videos. And uh, most of all, check out hashtag RT Podcast in the server for those episodes, and keep an eye on Announcements channel. Every single day, new events being announced. Make sure you know who's going on, what's going on, and when it's going on. Check the Announcements channel. That being said, welcome, Zoo. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you, sir? Yes, I'm doing quite well today. How are you doing, Shogun? I'm fantastic, thank you. It's been a wonderful day. Uh, looking forward to the weekend and really looking forward to this. I've actually been, well, this podcast has been coming down the pipe for a long time. And of course, your name in our server is Zoo. So you are literally named after this character. So um, I'm assuming there's a narrative story of this character, right? What he did, who he was, what he did, what he's known for. So I think that's, before we get into history, the culture, the mythology, can you give us the myth of, of Anzu, his own narrative story, as best you can? Right. I can be, uh, briefly give you a synopsis and everything of the most well-known story that was passed down from the Sumerians to the Akkadians, eventually the Babylonians, and the Babylonians were the last to actually keep the Sumerian language. They, uh, their priests were actually required at some point to do this, and we only have this today because they were using ceramic uh, clay tablets, essentially. And um, these clay tablets, when in the right psychometric conditions, were actually capable of preserving this information in a, an archaic form of script called a cuneiform um, for thousands of years. I mean, some of these older ones date back to being over 4,000 year texts. So it, it's beyond belief that, that we have them, but essentially the overall story goes that um, Zu or Anzu was this like half divine, half demonic uh, bird man, if you will. He was essentially applied to be a, a shapeshifter or a dragon. Um, one of the oldest dragon stories that there really is, uh, or dragon myths. And um, what had happened was is there was another character named Enlil, who was the Lord of the Storms, if you will. That was his role. He was basically like a heavenly uh, deity, if you will, a demigod. Um, and he had possession of what was called the Tablets of Destiny. Destiny. And how these worked is that whoever possessed them could control creation and existence of the entire universe with just their voice. Actually, like they don't really go into strong detail about that and everything. The only way to really key this in is in the story and how it's used. But essentially, Zoo being a very mischievous character, um, catches Enlil off guard and steals the Tablets of Destiny. And then all the Anunnaki, if you will, from the Sumerian myths or the uh, the pantheistic deities all stemming from Anu um, wanted to get him, but they were all afraid of him because he possessed this grand mighty weapon that allowed him to literally do whatever he wanted. So there's this character by the name of Marduk, who is the son of Enki, Enki being Enlil's brother or grandson of Anu, you know, the the pantheon's greatest deity at this time period and what he had done is he had set out um to go and retrieve the tablets of destiny and to keep it for himself and so to do this he failed absolutely miserably on his first attempt he, he goes in you know with a bow he goes to shoot the bow and zoo sees it and here comes the arrows coming to zoo and zoo literally realizes it and he goes no arrow, turn around and go back to who shot it. Arrow literally turns around mid place and goes back, scares Marduk practically to death, and he runs off. And so the only way for him uh, to do this, Marduk realizes he has to kill Zoo by a stealth. And eventually that's what he ends up doing. He ends up going into a second battle, but it's not really a battle because, you know, Zoo's got this very powerful magical weapon known as the Tablet of Destinies, and so he goes in, and he just 
zoo while he's asleep and while he's distracted and um that we know from what is called the zoo tablet um which is one of the babylonian tablets that they recovered in uh like the 1800s well thank you that's very interesting so now that you've told us that, uh, can you tell us a bit about why you uh, so much are interested in this character in particular? Uh, why do you think he's uh, so significant? And what do you think that significance is? I is the ep um, epithets and all the other versions of the story and everything. So he's known as Zoo, the divine storm firm. And of course, the epithet is very, uh, almost like a very strong adjective held to high status, only high status people or characters during those time periods in that culture had obtained a epithet, you know, just like, uh, you know, a king would. And so um, his is being the divine storm bird. And it's like, oh, what, what does that mean? Whatever. Well, it makes more sense whenever you look into some of his other um, epithets and the other stories. And one of them, he's known as Zoo, the flood storm weapon. And the reason for this is it's implied is that Anu or one of the great deities of the Sumerian pantheon got absolutely mad at the world and wanted all of humanity wiped out um, just because they were just getting on his nerves. And so he talked to Zoo or on Zoo and said, wipe out the work with a flood. So he did. And this kind of version of uh, many myths and everything, Zoo is seen as the one who actually caused the deluge. Um, in fact, this is one of the earliest tales we know of, of a flood storm, you know, that is written down in history. So it's really interesting because that's um, if you look into ancient mythology or even religions to this day that are still worshipped, that's one of the biggest themes is that there was some sort of great deluge that happened at least seven, eight thousand years ago, as far as we can tell. Um, and so what really just got me interested in this topic is the esoter uh, esoteric side of it. Whenever I started looking to YouTube channels like uh, Ancient Mystery, um, some really low key channels and everything that really started breaking down the symbolism and the stories and taking deep dives into it. And then um, on my own accord, just seeing all these synchronicities, like I was sitting here looking into the history of dragon myths and I find out the oldest one we have on record, uh, you know, dating back to potentially 7,000 years ago, or 5000 BC was about Anzu. And in this version of the story, the storm bird is actually a dragon. And I started thinking about it. I'm like, wait a second, flying beast that's capable of shooting lightning and, you know, seen as divine. And I start realizing that there's so many versions of this story and that they are definitely connected. And as I'm starting to think and look more into it, I'm starting to see so many parallels um, etymologically, uh, symbolically. You know, he was seen as the Eagle Man. And this is an ancient symbol that carries all the way over to modern day times and everything with, you know, the double headed ego or eagle that the Masons look up to. That was Anzu. Um, you know, it used to be a symbol for an empire, you know, a master of duality, you know, having one head look solely to the left while the other looking solely to the right and basically divide and conquer strategy. And we still see this phenomenon happen today. That's exactly how the United States uh, political party, for example, is designed, you know, just two opposed, uh, you, you know, groups and everything that, you know, just dis disagree on a couple topics, that, but m for the most part, agree. They are the two heads, if you will. Um, what was really fascinating about seeing all these and s looking through is that I just started seeing a trend that happened and I started delving into a conspiracy and talking to other people uh, about this ancient character who just keeps on appearing in every culture throughout all of time. And I'm wondering, okay, what's going on here? Like, I don't th I think it's just a random co coincidence that this same character by many, many different names, but the same symbols, same trademarks, same intellectual pro pro property, if you will, stories keeps on popping up in every culture throughout the world, throughout all of human history. And I'm wondering, why hasn't anyone noticed this? And then I started to discover there are a couple people who have, but it's just so hard to in a cohesive lucid manner without sounding 
schizophrenic for lack of a better word so kind of one of my quests is to break it down logically and get away from the esoteric mystic side to try coming up with something that you could explain to the layman without sounding like you know a crazy conspiracy theorist fascinating and well said so um what more can you tell us about zoo as a character what is his personality like is he good or evil uh does he have children does he fall in love uh does he have magical powers are there other details about him that we know yes um so what we do know is he's gone by many different names and at least the sumerian pantheon on zoo zoo and m dukud and these names and everything also explain what he is and so zoo and his um epithet he stands for you know the heavenly eagle or the eagle from the heavens watching over um what we can tell is that he definitely has a, a rich history within um his original story and everything he does have powers he does have uh children there's many different stories so one of them i can briefly go over is actually has the first reference of the character lilith and it was at this hapu tree, it was some sort of, um, you know, magical mystic tree, you know, that's a, another reoccurring theme, by the way, if you study comparative mythology. Um, and so Zoo is at one layer of it, and uh, Lilith's at another and everything, and they're seen as beasts. And so, um, essentially, the moral of the story is the gods come after him, and Zoo protects his young and runs away. So, yes, it's implied that Zoo has children. And it's briefly talked about in some of the other ones. But um, one of the most fascinating things about this is that he does have, like, supernatural powers, of course, um, in these narratives. And so, for example, he's seen as being able to control the waters. And one of the stories where he actually literally floods, floods the earth, he's, like, flying around like a thunderbird. And he's causing the entire world to just go to mayhem. Um, um, what was the other question you were asking me? I was just asking you to sort of uh, tell us any more that you can. And NSA, please close your video. You're breaking the, the video stream for the, the recording if two people are open. Okay, so I'm going to kick. Someone's got to disconnect NSA. So I was just saying, um, uh, asking you if you can elaborate at all on his personality, like uh, just what more we know about this character. Uh, and you answered that question. Uh, so now, is there other elements you want to develop that? So here's one question I want to ask you. Do you believe that Zoo is in some sense a real creature, a real, physically real character? Or is he uh, only a myth, in your opinion? Or was there some actual entity somehow corresponding to this, this being? No, um, I don't know for sure, per se, but of my personal belief, um, I do believe he, he might be a real character. Um, obviously, this isn't something I can prove, so it's something I leave at a grain of salt, if you will. But I, yes, I do believe he is potentially real. And not only that, I do believe if what I've been told by different theorists um, is true and all the research I've done, he's essentially a character who's always around Earth. If I had a guess, he's a character who's constantly incarnate living within this universe and potentially might even be one of the creators or um, related to the creator somehow. How? I don't know. Um, I suspect with his nature being, uh, he's known and described as half divine and half demonic. So I get this very Luciferian vibe. You know, if you're familiar with Gnosticism, um, that's exactly what they preach is the key to self deification is mastery over duality, if you will. And this is actually another one of the symbols um, esoterically hidden by mystery schools and ancient societies and Freemasons for a long time now is that two-headed eagle just, just represent the empire. It's what the empire itself represents underneath. And that is the master of duality, the master of uh, good and evil, the, you know, the fruit of uh, the knowledge of good and evil mastery over both over a population is key to maintaining it and guiding the sheep, if you will. So um, yes, to answer your question, I do believe 
that he he might actually be a real character and not just a myth. Okay, I'm gonna have to demote NSA for the rest of the night, unfortunately. Wait, what? What do you mean? I, well, because you're you're drunkenly messing with the podcast. So no offense, you're gonna get your rank back in the morning, but I have to leave you as a Kingsman for the rest of the night so that I can manage you because you're you're shit faced and you fucked up two podcasts. What do you mean? I know you don't understand, and that's the problem. So I'm gonna mute you. Please don't unmute yourself. Okay, we will now resume. Uh, so. Zoo, uh, I've asked you, you know, to tell us the narrative, uh, to tell us about the character of Zoo, the dragon. And now I'd just like you to tell us anything else that you wanted to cover today, um, as this was the topic you had in mind, uh, but not one I know a lot about. So um, maybe you would be best to take it from here. Yes. Um, so with this topic and everything, it's something that it's so hard to connect the dots and everything in a cohesive manner and everything. But essentially what I did while doing my research is just follow the steps and the steps don't just begin with zoo. Zoo isn't the first rendition of this character. Even um, to look further back into this, you have to look into a character named Opsu or, you know, the one who comes from the primordial abyss, the one who comes from chaos itself. And, um, I started seeing a lot of symbolism there, and I started seeing that in the descriptions of um, Apsu, a lot of the order out of chaos idea comes from. And essentially, in that cosmology, it starts off that there was a void and there was nothing. And then after the void came a primordial chaos. Um, and after primordial chaos, which was typically um, characterized by Tiawath or Tiamat, um, as feminine came Apsu, who was and a little side note and everything, Su and Zu in the Sumerian language, as we've been recently discovering, uh, thanks to some very, very diligent linguists, they're interchangeable pronunciations, they're dialectal, if you will. And so saying Sumerian quite literally is the same as saying Zumerian, uh, linguistically speaking. And so with this character, Apsu, he was seen as the one who created the order out of the chaos. He, he came into existence and saw that it was nothing but chaos and decided to rearrange everything into his order. And so this goes into another set of um, old Babylonian and Akkadian myths where in, instead of Zu, uh, it's this character named Apsu, who, who means the one who comes from the abyss or it also means the uh, from the ocean, the ocean being a synonymous with the word abyss in this ancient sense. Um, and so he decided to create the um, the order out of the, the chaos, and he's essentially the one who organized the universe in this story. And eventually, the culmination of this uh, that he created. The deities and then the deities in turn created the humans and then eventually the humans kept on getting on his nerves so much that he decided to try wiping them out and then um some of the deities get mad they decide to wipe Apsu out team mod gets mad she tries to go wipe out the other deities and everything and it leads on to this this huge cosmic drama almost like a opera if you will or soap opera if you will and so that's one of the early, earliest renditions. And then eventually um, there's many characters who start following this line. Um, so funny enough, if you were to spell the word Zeus, it, it is spelled, it could be spelled Z-U-U-Z, the same forwards as backwards. And I, I found that to be just a, such a weird coincidence just because it was... Um, you know, it falls in line with hermetic beliefs quite well. It, it follows the hermetic beliefs quite well. One of the axioms being same boards as it is backwards. And, you know, these are the same groups who essentially esoterically keep this line of tradition uh, going through the mystery schools. And, um, you know, they have oral traditions on this even when we didn't have access to the documents themselves. It's quite amazing. 
but essentially with this character he, um have opsu which is almost synonymous with the zoo and you start seeing similar totems symbols and everything like for example zoo is known as the eagle man the bird man if you will um he was known for destroying the world with a flood out of anger um or due to some sort of anger if you will he was known as the D divine storm bird which is synonymous with the thunderstorm and therefore eventually became um you know being as someone who had control over the storms and what controls the storms well thunder and lightning and then that's when it really starts getting into all these other characters like for example um zeus whose totem animal is the eagle whose name can literally be spelled and phonetically if you will as zoo forwards and backwards you're just combining the same name, one forwards, Z-U, and the backwards rendition of it, U-Z. It's pronounced exactly the same. Um, only that, in Greek mythology, Zeus is known for completely wiping out mankind in a deluge out of some sort of anger. A very similar, there, there's some parallels. You know, I... If I were to be very anal and meticulous about this, I would say, oh, well, the no one could say that there's enough parallels to definitively, in an academic sense, link them together. But there's enough, if you will. Um, and I start seeing other things. So, you know, in the personality of Zeus, paralleling that of Anzu, um, there was another character, and this is in one of the um oldest germanic languages known as old high german whose name is zo uh, z-o-u and i started looking more into that character and i found out that was one of the earliest names for odin you know the very famous odin the one you see from the uh mcu movies if you will um, the, the father of thor yeah the guy the one-eyed if you will and started thinking about it and i'm like you know he's a lot like the zeus character there's obviously completely different stuff in the stories and whatnot um just really weird though he's you know control of the storms head of a pantheon uh he's characterized by birds specifically the raven and then i go and i'm doing some more research and i real i stumble upon um a one of the more rare stories about Anzu and this rendition, he's not an eagle, he's a raven. And I notice, wait a second, I've seen this before, and I've seen it once before by a similar character, by a similar name. A character who's bullized by the ravens and symbolizes being keen and perceptive and being kind of a trickster, kind of having anger issues, um, you know kind of being bipolar if you be honest you know what i mean um i'm sitting here like okay obviously this isn't anything i could definitively prove in an academic sense uh, by some peer-reviewed um paper or anything like that but it's enough to want to be like okay this is really interesting and once i started talking to some um hermeticists and everything who are oftentimes syncretists anyways. And what what that basically means is they take things from multiple mythologies and they try to synchronize the elements, trying to link together specifically characters from different pantheons of a similar enough region. And one of the most famous examples of this has to do with uh, three religions and how one character, one character gets connected to all three religions by some of these uh, hermeticists, if you will. And that would be Thoth is a Metatron. Thoth being from the Egyptian path, the unknown is the god of writing, known as being a bird man. Then you have Hermes, who is a messenger deity uh, within the Greek pantheon. And um, in the Abrahamic religions, more specifically Apocryphon, if you will, because it's not uh, mentioned in any of the uh, Christian canonical works. This would be all extra biblical works, such as the Book of Watchers, the Book of Enoch. Uh, stuff like that. There's, of course, Metatron, and in some of those 
stories and everything, it goes that um, a mortal man by the name of Enoch, um, son of Jared, son of Cain, those are two different Enochs. You can go back and read Genesis uh, if you want to see that clarification. Um, and also the father of Methuselah. Uh, fun fact, Methuselah is the longest living man in the Bible. Uh, and the Genesis little uh, genealogy thing. Well, and the book of Enoch, a lot more famous these days and everything. People like to really talk about that. Um, God realizes that Enoch uh, was kind of a righteous man, developed a personal relationship and gave Enoch essentially the opportunity to become like the angels. And so when Enoch ascended to the high heavens, he ended up becoming Metatron and became the scribe of God, the voice of God. And this, these similar elements and everything as a messenger, someone who writes things down, someone who carries information and preserves it throughout all of time is what led a, a lot of these hermeticists to connect these three completely different characters from completely different cultures and pantheons and uh, geographical locations, though close enough, if you will, um, into one cohesive being. And I, I started realizing... What if this is just one shape shifting character going across all of these different time periods, just going by different names and rebranding himself, if you will? And that's what essentially led me to this unified theory um, that kind of connects everything back from the Sumerian civilization, which, by the way, is our first real civilization in recorded history. Um, even now, I mean, you can't go anywhere without seeing a symbol that we know now is directly linked to zoo everywhere. It's on the Russian flag. It was on the Byzantine flag back there in power. The Romans helped make it popularized. The Albanian flag uses it. The double-headed eagle is used by the Vatican in a lot of their imagery. And it's like, why these people, these so-called priesthoods, um, because, you know, there's a lot of priesthoods involved in kind of keeping this, like, for example, the Vatican. Why would they knowingly use a symbol back to some sort of pagan character? Like, it's just kind of like odd, out of stuff place and everything. Of course, they have a whole different story about it. They're like, oh, just, a, you know, a carryover from Rome, blah, 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 blah. And... You really can't go anywhere without seeing this. And when you start looking onto the more um, secret oral traditions preserved by mystery schools, they start elaborating a little bit more on it. Um, they start kind of uh, showing that this two-headed eagle, if you will, is, we know now today originated in that symbol originated in Sumeria. We've been able to collect that through uh, archaeological works and everything of the original uh, descriptions. In fact, the uh, thumbnail and photo tied to this podcast is one of the older depictions of this. Um, these are kind of like stone wall depictions that they did as ancient artwork. And um, if you look into Freemason symbolism and everything, one of the characters they uh, worship and they put a lot of symbolism behind it is this like two-headed eagle with the number 33 um, it's got a sword in his talon and a crown on his head. I just found that really interesting. Why would this be the only character in, like that we really know in a lot of these secret societies? Like, uh, secret oral traditions that has a crown above their head. Because as far as we know, they're monotheistic. As, as far as we know, exoterically and even esoterically, um, they are monotheistic in the sense that they worship a higher power or being known as the grand architect of the universe. Uh, uh, real quick and everything, I'm going to clarify, I'm not a Freemason or anything. I just know this from researching and talking to people and talking to ex-Masons and looking deep into their symbolism. But anyways, the crown itself represents kingdom, you know, the highest elevation so I'm, just, I'm sitting here and i'm thinking i'm like wait a second 
they trying to say that this two-headed bird is a depiction of what they call the grand architect of the universe? I'm sitting here like... Essentially, connecting all these elements throughout time, I start seeing these same patterns over and over and over again. Um, many names. Quetzalcoatl being just another one of these uh, storm character bird dragons or whatever who can shapeshift. Uh, that was a character worshipped by the Aztecs. They would literally uh, kill people in these pyramids, if you will. Another uh, you know, similarity is that a lot of these places that worship and talk about what I see as the same character always do so, building to pyramids. And there's always kind of like sun worship involved, but the Aztecs would literally commit human sacrifice in the name of this character. The Mayans also had a character that is practically synonymous by the name of Colkin. And then you look at the Aborigines and they've got a character named the the rainbow serpent once again very similar character you look into eastern and western mythologies and there's always some sort of powerful drag character dragon character um especially in even eastern mythologies and this weird idea that some sort of bird man or dragon man some sort of shapeshifter if you will kind of going around and and it's not just over in Asia, or in Australia, South America, Europe, you even go to North America and you talk to all these different tribes. And almost all of them, whether it be the Hopi or the Cherokee, um, or whether it be the Sioux, all these Native American tribes usually s start talking about this Thunderbird character or this dragon character who parallels this. And I'm sitting here thinking, how is it? All these completely different groups have such a similar story. They've not been in contact and been isolated for thousands of years. So maybe I've wondered, maybe we should actually take a little bit more, um, give, give these stories a little bit more um, credit, or just a little bit and everything to examine um, and almost always when you look into how these stories came about and everything, you know, you, you get to talking to people, you start realizing, well, these were passed down by some traveling character wandering all throughout the world throughout all of time. Um, you know, it's it up being the same story being retold to some group of people, um, some tribe, and that tribe ends up passing that down via oral tradition alone most of these stories i looked at have only been part of oral tradition up until maybe the past decade or so until the past you know in the past couple of decades a lot of these more tribal oral traditions are now being recorded and documented by people traveling and you're just starting to see the same thing all over again as similarities and everything and of course the secularists and the atheists want to uh, break it down as being as simple as, oh, it's just anthropomorphism of nature and the storms and everything like that. But there's just certain key elements that are, are just almost universal, if you will, whether it be the pyramids, geometry, art, um, themes, narratives, even all around the world, uh, just be a, um, a personification of nature itself. It's it implies that there's something much more intelligent behind this process, some sort of intelligent communication happening on a global scale long or the age of globalism that we live in today. And it's just been a very fascinating topic. And the more I look into, the more I see into it. It's not like it pushed me over the edge and believe in that this conspiracy is true. If anything, I'm more or less agnostic on the belief because they're just know like something definitive but i do personally believe that there might be some character who's been wandering through all of time and uh he's just kind of a watcher character he's uh they call him a shapeshifter and everything 
Um, I think he's been going by different names if he does exist, different cultures, um, and he's been a part of this process for quite some time. You you might like the Book of Enoch. <laughs> Oh, sorry, uh, there's no only one person speaking in this room right now, which is Zoo, uh, and let's see you later. Go ahead, Zoo, sorry. But, yeah, I just I just found it to be a very fascinating topic because, um, you know, I, I start seeing all these connections and everything, and, yeah, the psychiatrists call it apophenia and everything, where you basically uh, attach uh, symbolisms and omens that aren't, necessarily connected and everything to actual events but i actually start seeing this same story played out over and over again and after so many times eventually i came to the possibility of this being true and if so then there's some grand unified theory that maybe some character throughout all of time maybe even an archon who really knows i don't uh, i don't proclaim to know is and has been behind a lot of the things going on in our reality and writing the stories helping preserve it helping uh you know passing down the information be it throughout all of time and um i have eventually just kind of come to when thinking about it thinking that maybe this might be a character who's influencing you know um things that go on with this, this reality he might even be synonymous with the idea of the demurge, you know, the lion-headed dragon, if you will, which uh, in some of the older depictions and everything, it shows Anzu, and he's got lions beside him, you know, at his feet. You know, this bird man or dragon, if you will, who's also associated with the sun and lions. And it's like every religion or pantheon I look into, um, whether it be the Hindus or it really doesn't matter who, I start seeing these archetypal uh, synchronicities, if you will, between all of it. But looking through and kind of exploring and kind of going through a phase of doing this for probably a year, year and a half now, it just became one of those things that I couldn't help but notice it. You know, it, it became a something that just was it's hard to describe in words and everything until i can actually like lay out all the different things and the more i've been laying it out the more i've been looking into it the more i start re realizing that this might be an actual thing Okay, so do you want to open it up to audience questions and participation now? Awesome. Or did you have more things that you wanted to discuss first? That essentially lays out basically what I wanted to present in a nutshell, because I'm kind of keeping the, this to a in the nutshell kind of level of, of this topic and everything. So yes, we can move on to questions. Just a quick question. Have you ever watched a YouTuber called Asha Logos? What's that? Have you ever seen a YouTuber named Asha Logos? He covers uh, this topic, how every ancient civilization is connected with each other. I haven't seen the channel per se, but I've heard of um these theories before uh is there anything you could like elaborate on like uh give like a synopsis of what this guy's beliefs are or what's the most recurrent thing he brings up well the videos that he's been recently been pumping out is the background story of the aura linda book and it's a book that dates back all the way to 21,000 bc and it mentions about the worldwide flood which I find it interesting how every ancient mythology has a flood story. And on top of this, um, the Book of Enoch, which somebody here in the voice chat mentioned, what was very spooky is that the Book of Enoch mentioned how back then there was a one world civilization, just like we see today with globalism, all that stuff. Well, 
Well, what's funny about that is in the biblical narrative and thus also the extra biblical narrative, um, it was actually uh, the character who's also recognized as being the founder of the country of Babylonia, um, a.k.a. Nimrod, the great-grandson of um, Noah, I believe. Um, the grandson of Cush, um, son of Noah, uh, who's responsible for founding this civilization of Babylonia. And this, of course, all happens within the Mesopotamian region. Therefore, um, it's almost logical to say that um, the Tower of Babel incident that is spoken of in the Genesis story likely happened in Mesopotamia. Interesting coincidence, considering um, that's where all these ancient Sumerian, that's where the Sumerian civilization was, it's where the Akkadian civilization was, it's um, where the Assyrian civilization was. You have so many different tribal groups kind of warring and then coming together and forming groups. And it was also Babylon who had preserved the Sumerian language the longest, and it was Babylonian works um, where we find these zoo tablets. Yes, yes. I was actually just briefly mentioning that when I was talking about the lion-headed dragon, um, you know. Yes, uh, yeah, I've looked heavily into Gnosticism. At one point, I was a bit of a Gnosticist, if you will. Um, read some of the Nag Hammadi works and everything. Uh, you know, I've delved into those conspiracies. I even got to the point where I was delving into more heretical ones, considering I am now a Christian. Um, but the main ones that I, I found fascinating were with the um, the concept of Yaldabuth, or uh, the, also known as the Merge, who's almost always symbolized by this dragon with a lion's head. And, you know, that symbol, you can easily break down into a layman's terms as, okay, so a lion is a very prideful being, you know, just like Simba. Uh, carries over pride rock and it's known for its boasting roar if you will and a dragon the ancient snake if you will uh is seen as kind of like this very sneaky character that slithers into it and so when you kind of connect those uh two parts of the symbolism you start saying that what they're basically saying about y yalda booth is that he's a very prideful being who's very sneaky and cryptic and clever and cunning um, who's always roaring, um, always coming up, always coming around. He's kind of just like a cosmic man-child, if you will. That's one of the things that um, kind of turned me off about Gnosticism. One of the things also I started noticing about Gnosticism that a lot of New Age people who subscribe to these Gnostic beliefs end up uh, believing in two completely paradoxical things or completely contradictory things. They say you need to obtain, obtain uh, ego death, therefore means that you have no ego and you're completely selfish and have obtained some sort of grandmaster level of humility. And then at the same time, a lot of them say, oh, by the way, number one thing is uh, self-deification is the idea of um, apotheosis that you're going to be able to ascend to godlike uh, status by having a mastery over good and evil and all that sort of stuff and so when i really started taking deep dive into gnosticism and what they believe and their ideas and everything i started just realizing that it was absolutely contradictory in both senses and that there was just no organization behind uh, a lot of Gnostic beliefs.
Yes. So the pneuma elation, everything is actually where one of those uh, main stories that I was talking about is actually presented in that story. And uh, it's one of the most well-known archaeological finds of the past 100, 150 years. They've been, uh, they took forever to decipher it. But essentially, that's the Babylonian uh, cosmology and their belief system in a nutshell and everything. And it's basically spread across uh, six or seven tablets. And in one of those tablets um, in the Numa Alicia, um, Zoo is briefly mentioned, you know, the battle between Marduk and Zoo um, uh, uh, happens within one of those tablets. And in fact, um, it's a very interesting work. I would definitely recommend looking into it, especially like certain parts of it. There's one part of it called the 50 names of Marduk. And this is basically after he's conquered Zoo and he's conquered all these things. He's this massive hero and he ends up getting declared essentially like the creator and God of the universe when he's obviously like not the original character in their pantheon or their creation story. He's someone who comes much later on. Yeah, well, one thing I've noticed in reading those texts is that oftentimes the gods who are destroying humanity, like in, in the Gilgamesh stories and stuff like that, uh, they the gods don't seem to be aware of their own power and they're rather shocked when the destruction occurs. It almost feels like they're they're they've inherited some kind of power. And um I think in Enoch they mentioned you mentioned like individuals who might be ancient and watching and like the term used in Enoch is literally watcher. Uh for these like kind of weird beings who are not quite God, but have somehow acquired power akin to God and tend to pretend to be God, but oftentimes make mistakes because they don't know what they're dealing with. And the power oftentimes seems to go against them. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, it's really funny and everything because, uh, yeah, the Watchers is definitely plays a huge role into all this and everything. Uh, so the Watchers is also kind of the same idea of the Archons and everything, essentially. Um, you know, this group of beings who uh, at some point or another were watchers or observers over reality and then eventually ended up getting tempted by women. And uh, in the Book of Enoch specifically, uh, there is a group of watchers led by uh, characters like Samael and Azazel um, and characters very rarely mentioned within the biblical context or the Torah itself, but you can find an extra biblical or um, on talk uh, Jewish literature, basically what uh, Christians would consider apocrypha. Um, and in the Book of Enoch specifically, these watchers who had in inherited the secret knowledge of the heavens were uh, the ones accused of giving mankind all sorts of things that they misuse, weapons, warfare, um, combat strategy, um, to even other things like cosmetics, uh, certain technologies like metallurgy, um, all of these get attributed to these uh, rebellious angels who, in the narrative, end up getting locked up, especially the uh, major ones behind it, like Azazel and Samael. And some people even believe that Samael is uh, linked with Satan himself. Actually, yeah, there's a huge one. There's a huge, not just archetype, but story itself. It's a almost like a one. It's an archetype, and also it's the oldest format for an epic that there is. So, okay, an epic isn't just a poetic narrative. It's specifically one surrounding a hero, and this goes into the idea. Uh, another famous kind of philosopher um, around that time spoke of. Uh, known as the hero's myth or the hero's calling. It's basically this format surrounding all, and it basically almost all heroic narratives go around this. And it's the whole idea of the man gets the sword 
And if he wants to get the blessings of whatever, whether it be gold or whatnot, he's got to slay the dra- dragon. This is one of the most uh, commonly seen tropes throughout uh, medieval literature and um, literature stemming from even before that. You can even use that for, um, to characterize the Zeus story because that's exactly what happened. This is one of the most ancient renditions of. So you got this character who's seen as the bad guy, the villain, and then he gets wiped out by some um, the good guy, aka Marduk. Um, and it was, you know, portrayed as something that must have been impossible, and no one thought Marduk could do it except for one guy who believed in him. Marduk fails on his first try. Um, you know, he accepts defeat and gets humility, gets reborn from it, and goes back and he wins, and, and eventually gets declared to be the most powerful being in the universe. And if, if funny enough, it was the Babylonians who worshipped Marduk above everyone else, uh, so much so that they called him. Well, not Marduk, B-E-L, um, because his name was supposed to be seen as such high reverence that you cannot sp- speak it. Um, so, yes, and also on your uh, question about the Jungian archetypes, there's two main ones you really see with the serpent slash dragon, and it just kind of depends on what you're looking at. You're, you're kind of seeing uh, this very wise creature in one, uh, you know, he was not really involved, kind of keep very isolatory, kind of like a hermit living in a cave. Um, and is capable, capable of offering great wisdom to others. And then on the bad side, the flip side, if you will, there's the one of the more famous ones we know from uh, in Western thought because it's seen within the biblical narrative itself of uh, the the venomous snake, who's the uh, the reason why everything in reality sucks, you know, Satan himself, um, someone who's prideful and arrogant and cunning and uh, lives only for himself. And I mean, that's exactly where the idea of uh, you want to call someone by an insult, you call them a snake in the grass. So untrustworthy, they're basically uh, bottom feeding scum who slithers on the ground. And even in the biblical narrative, it's um, said that um, Satan was cast to the ground or the serpent was cast to the ground to crawl on its belly and to me that potentially implies that he might have had wings beforehand do we know? Um, when, not really linguistically though if you look into the Hebrew language uh, the word used was seraph which is oftentimes a word that you could associate with the dragons a fire breathing creature with wings Uh, We're still getting a little bit of mic feedback when you breathe on your mic once in a while. Just a heads up. Go ahead. Zoo, it really, just to just a quick to fix that, you're gonna have to move your mic away from your mouth. Like you have to talk instead of talking directly into the mic, you have to move it to the side of your mouth so it doesn't get the air from your nose or your mouth. Uh, I I just want to ask if you're aware that like stories like I, we today oftentimes like to contrast these stories from like Babylon or Bible and, and claim they were stealing from each other or like they were competitive. But like, if we look in like the actual archeological record, they're oftentimes in the same libraries of people. And it seems like the cultures just viewed them as kind of just the same story with different names. I, I know that like, um, I think Marduk as well as Gilgamesh are in the Dead Sea Scrolls and considered like heroes of the Jewish faith also. And th- there seems to be a lot more overlap that we today miss whereas back then like we we today look back and think oh oh they were stealing from each other whereas if you were back then they would just think yeah you know you know it's like it's like dick versus richard same name different pronunciation uh and then all the same like kind of stories like I've, I've even heard like gilgamesh should be viewed as nimrod and they should be viewed as the same people uh i've personally done some language studies for fun and kind of have come to the conclusion that uh Zoroaster and the biblical Daniel are probably the same person because they were both high priests at the same time. And you can't have two high priests of the Magi. It has to be one. And uh, Daniel's... Sorry, this is a question. This is a question of like, what you think about it. But like, you know, Daniel's Babylonian name basically contains Zoroaster in it. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, to what degree like, we, we lose sight of it being 
it was viewed as a meta meta story, not as like competition or, or theft from each other. So interesting note on that and everything. Um, we do know from the biblical uh, story and everything that, in fact, at one point, um, Babylon captures and exiles Judah within it. Of course, since we're speaking about Daniel, he was a uh, in the story. He's a character who's a a Judean captive and everything. And we also know from archaeological history that. Um, a lot of the works that became part of what is the Tanakh or the Old Testament for the Christians do come from the Second Temple period, which means this happened after the exile. So it wouldn't be inconceivable to say or or to see how there might be some sort of cultural influence on these Semitic groups. Um, one of one another and everything especially considering daniel had to speak uh aramaic you know he, he would have had to learn aramaic and everything as part of um being babylonian which this is also would have been when the jewish or judean people would have been introduced to the language of aramaic as a result of having uh to conform to the aristocracy of the babylonians at the time and it's funny because some of the bible itself is actually written in aramaic um, and Jesus would have spoken Aramaic, something potentially actually happening as a result of this cross-cultural uh, exchange that's going on. And furthermore, and everything, if you look even farther back, um, the reason why we know of these stories has completely to do with cross-cultural exchange of information, because what is known about the Sumerians a lot of it and the language itself was preserved by later uh, groups of people, the Babylonians. So the Babylonians would have uh, kept this in their, they kept this as part of their uh, religious story. So therefore only people in the highest priesthood caste would have known how to speak or write um, in this language of the Sumerian language, which by the way is a language isolate. Um, it is not a Semitic language, unlike the language spoken by the Akkadians, Babylonians, Arabs, uh, the Hebrews, all of them. It's, it's something that formed in such enough uh, insulation geographically, that it is considered to be completely distinct and not part of the Semitic fam uh, family tree of languages. By the way, that's much better on your mic. If you've moved it, it's like perfect, whatever you've done. Appreciate that. Yeah, I, I moved it just completely to the side and everything. Um, I don't think I, I'll be breathing directly anymore. Thank you very much. So this has been a great podcast, great content as always. Uh, Zoo's uh, previous podcast, you definitely want to check out about the Sumerian uh, and Babylonian and other um, the Anunnaki. I'll make sure to post that in the general chat right away so you guys can check it out. Very good, very popular podcast as well. Uh, so one more time for the audience. Does anyone have a question or a comment for Zoo while we got him here? Uh, if you want to say anything about, you know, we see Magi at the birth of Jesus and we know that like Daniel was chief of the magi in the old testament and like who the magi are like a pagan priesthood so why was this the bible emphasize this pagan priesthood coming to see jesus after it had like you know like daniel had kind of like taken it over and then it's weird like usually we're, we're brought up to think oh it's it's not our religion and so don't regard it as anything important and yet the bible points to this pagan pagan priesthood being invited into the religion almost Yeah, it's yeah. How it, they, uh, the magi or the magis, uh, people who are known as wise priests. I mean, we're talking about um, basically high priests of uh, you know a different Semitic sort of um, theocratic system. Um, people who are very knowledge knowledgeable about ancient astrology. In fact, um, the same magi or term, if you will, is also found in Persia, which is where a lot of um, this, um, not just Persia, but also Babylon, but our oldest systems for astrology or understanding the stars, um, and basically anthropomorphizing them and putting it into a sophisticated, 
um, organized system of beliefs and its own stories and everything do come from both Persia and Chaldea by the Chaldeans, which, by the way, is just another uh, name for a certain group of Babylonians. So we do know there is a connection between, um, you know, certain characters from, you know, the Babylonian and Persian areas within the biblical narrative itself. And they're not once condemned than the biblical narrative. It's only in separate scriptures are um, that things like astrology is uh, condemned um, for what reason. We don't know why. But what we do know from the biblical story is that these characters were essentially like wise mystics who were able to see signs and omens within the heavens um, and be able to determine, uh, you know, on their own accord and get together and be like, oh, by the way, I just saw the sign of the star. Oh, I did too. You know what this means? It means the Messiah is coming and be here. And they, they go to Herod and they're like, by the way, the Messiah's here. Herod freaks out. And they eventually go and find Jesus. So, yeah, I, I do find it really interesting that um, these this cast or group of people um, are mentioned within the biblical narrative itself, despite all the attempts by, you know, later um, Christian groups and everything to completely dismiss that as being like, oh, well, God can use the pagans too. So thank you, Zoo. Um, maybe I'll just give you one last chance. Is there any closing thoughts or message you would like to get out to the audience in the room, but especially the audience on YouTube and BitChute tonight? Yeah, I definitely like to say um, the reason why uh, this theory, uh, a lot of which, which has come from my own synchronization and my own like picking pieces to here and there of uh, these uh, similarities and how these things parallel. Uh, a reason why I find it so interesting is because it does have like a unif unification to it uh, across all of time, you know, human history and um, civilization and, um, you know, geographies all around the world. And so I, th I definitely think like, I'm not trying to like convince you to believe in this idea and everything. I definitely think you should just at least check out some of the source narratives, like the new Malish um, that we were talking about previously or even just like looking up some of the stories uh pertaining to it and you know uh just kind of getting a basic amount of, of information by your own research by your reading of uh zoo and the character behind it. it i think that itself was fascinating and should captivate captivate your curiosity Thank you so much for your time, Zoo. Thank you so much for this fascinating information. Certainly going to have to go back and re-listen to this to retain it all. Uh, but um, I'm sure people have learned a lot, and I'll continue to research these topics as well. Hopefully we can have you back on the podcast soon. Uh, do keep your eye on the general chat as I'm going to post Zoo's previous podcast about the Anunnaki, and you should check it out. Like I said, it's uh, one of our best podcasts we've done. And uh, that being said, we should jump up to one of the occupied rooms, perhaps the pub, I suggest. Uh, but before we do, make sure you watch the YouTube and BitChute podcast. We have over 200 episodes. I particularly ask everyone to watch the one with my ex-wife, Andy. You can find that in the announcements channel. Uh, it's also in the RT podcast channel. Uh, also check out the one with my grandmother. Uh, she's almost 100 years old. It's called Memories of World War II. Uh, that's a very interesting one as well. Um, that being said, oh yeah, and my testimony, which you can find the announcements channel about um, being born again in Christ. And on that note, I'm going to be giving another testimony uh, probably within a week or so. So please do listen to the last one, as it will really explain the next one. Now, Zoo, thanks so much for stepping in on short notice. Uh, thank you guys all for your patience getting this uh, up and running. And I'm so glad we stuck with it and got another great episode recorded. Thank you, Ainsoft, uh, and thank you also... Uh, Neverborn for being our new OBS recorders and another exciting thing, Zoo, you are our first ever roundtable video podcast guest. So that is in the history books for all time. You are the original video star. And if you ever want to have your own video series or be the first one to make a YouTube show, uh, we can talk about that too. Thanks, everybody. Uh, let's jump up to the other rooms. God bless.